How's it going, everybody? Thank you for uh, tuning into this video. I really, really do appreciate you. Um, honestly, none of this would be possible without people like you tuning in, you know, commenting, liking, disliking, sharing, saying something about the video. It, it, it's just really helpful. So I appreciate you. And I hope you find some value in this conversation. It's going to be an interesting conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. And you know what? If you do, and then you, for some weird reason, feel like you should financially support a an empty-headed 26-year-old ginger living with his parents, and you also want to get to watch these videos before they launch on YouTube, and if you want to be able to forward your uh, personal questions to the guests that I have on, like Dr. Henny, like Lynn Auden, Rick Rule, Lynette Zhang, Keith Newmeyer, what may have you, many others, you might want to consider joining the private Discord community where uh, we basically discuss you know all kinds of topics related to investing and 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 you know dividend investing commodities investing growth investing uh but more so than anything else right now the the group is focused on uh uranium we also discuss gold and silver uh the group is ten dollars a month so it is paid and that also has its reasons you can uh if you want to understand why it has to be paid in my opinion, you can read more about the group and, and how to join it over on Patreon. So that's Patreon-Baby Investments. Uh, besides that, though, as always, I want to give you a fair disclaimer and an honest confession. I am not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice, and you should take responsibilities for your own actions. This video, this this whatever podcast, whatever way you're consuming this, is this is just me and a friend of mine chatting, Okay. We're not saying what you should or should not do with your money as investing investing is just something very personal. I've said that a thousand times and I'll keep on saying this because I really believe it. I, for one, have a, a very high risk appetite. Uh, I am inexperienced on top of that. I, I've only been serious about this for, I guess, less than two years now. And I've, I've already made and will likely make many investment mistakes uh, in the future. So, uh, you know, I, I do not have any serious credentials that make me follow worthy or anything among those lines. So I'm just definitely not to be seen as any type of guru, expert, financial advisor, or anything among those lines. I'm not, okay? Investing involves taking risks, and I just want you to take a serious look into what some of the risks are of investing and how to manage them before you even start thinking about where and how to deploy your hard-earned money. Okay, because if you do not exercise patience and prudence, as Rick Rose says, you will likely lose money. In addition, though, it could also happen so that we discuss a company, uh, an investment, a stock, whatever, whatever it might be, which I or the guest personally uh, own and, and, and would be benefited by an increased interest in that investment. Okay, so you should know that Dr. Henny, for example, has a leading role in many companies that I have a business relationship with. And some of them I even own to my own name. So that obviously makes me biased. And I just think it's fair for you to know all that, okay? It's also safer for you to just consider both of us extremely biased and not to blindly trust me, the guest, or for that matter, to be honest, anybody on the internet. So well, uh, with all that said, Dr. Henny, thank you for uh, investing your time in me once again. Absolute pleasure, Antonio, as always. Yeah, pleasure is all mine. We're going to tackle a very, very interesting topic here that I've uh, taken out some points that I, that I want to talk about. So it's going to be interesting. I'm definitely looking forward to that. Uh, it's also been a while since we, since we last spoke, but I know time is pushing. So I don't want to, I don't want to lose any, any of your time today in, in small talks. Let's just kick the door in and start with it. You told me last time, like, hey, Antonio, listen, there's a big problem. Something's going on in mining. I'm not liking, you know, the, the you know, the, the, I, I'm not liking where this is going. So I guess you can tell me in a few words, what's the problem here? What's the big problem, Dr. Haney? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, mining is a small industry, okay? If you look at a lot of industries, you know, compared to tech, for example, this is microscopic, okay? And these junior companies, like if you tucked them all in, the, in a basket and you total up their market cap, is really just a small fraction of the overall market cap of, say, you know, one, one big tech company like Apple. It's, you know, it's a very small percentage. Okay. Now, we, we as an industry have done an absolutely terrible job of attracting interest to this space and, and investment. You know, the capital that's needed to keep this industry going uh, it hasn't been coming lately, okay? The last three or four months in particular, even though I, I still firmly believe we're in a, overall a long-term bull 
in the gold space and, and other commodities, I see uh, just an absolute dearth, uh, you know, an absence, like a vacuum of the capital showing up that, that we need to sustain the industry. Now, why? Well, part of it is, you know, it is an illiquid market, but the illiquidity comes from the fact that we don't have a lot of people coming into the space, okay? If there were lots of people, you know, at the party, so to speak, you would see the liquidity, the trading activity in a lot of stocks improve dramatically. Okay, mm-hmm. so liquidity is really just a symptom. What we're, we're lacking is, uh, you know, a clear picture of how people can make money in the space. Like people look at this space and they, they just don't see it. They, they look in and they think, my gosh, you know, this uh, mining industry is, is quite frankly a little dodgy. I mean, we've got things working against us like, like uh, you know, we're mining, okay? A lot of people are, tend to be environmentally conscious these days, and they think, oh, my goodness, mining, you know, this is not a good industry. Well, hold on, hold on. Everybody needs stuff, okay? And many of the people in this industry are not bad people. We, we don't want to destroy the earth. But, you know, there's a, there is a, a, a bias around the industry, you know, from that. That perception is out there, okay? I'll put later on the table. But the other thing is <clears throat> they look in and they think, my gosh, you know, you got a bunch of, of people who are, are in it for short-term gain, who are in it for, uh, you know, to, to manipulate money out of folks. Uh, you know, they see it as truly a dodgy industry. And we've got to improve our image, okay? Uh, there's a lot of things around how this whole system works in, in the mining space that need a, a fundamental redo. Mm. It's a tough industry to, to begin with, right? It's tough to understand it. You got to understand that these things, like you got to understand the rocks, the machineries, the process, whatever. There's a lot of financing. There's a lot of things that you got to understand here. So it's tough enough to begin with. It's a crucial industry. I guess that's obvious. Doesn't really, we don't really have to mention it, but it's tough to start investing in. And then you have a lot of market participants, I guess, that you, that you told me about that are sort of looking to take advantage from retail investors like myself, for example. So um, you, you gave me a list off mic here. So I'd like to, to talk about that. There's a few market participants that you told me can, could take advantage of us. One of those that you said was uh, brokers. And that was an interesting one for me because I don't know too much about it. What do you mean by that? Uh, now, look, brokers, where do they make their money? They tr- make money by trading. Okay, well, you know, Trading shares is you know, gains fees for them. So that's one place. But they also make money by helping companies raise capital, okay? The fees that they get off of uh, those those placements, these junior companies, as you know, 90, 95% of them are, are not cash flowing, okay? These companies have to go to the market. They have to go raise capital. Well, guess where they turn? They, they go to the brokers to help raise this money. And in turn, the brokers get fees for the placement, uh, usually it's cash and also shares. You know, a lot of retailers, if they're not aware of that, the brokers get uh, things what are called warrant, uh, you know, broker warrants, which are basically the right to a buy a share or exercise a warrant to buy a share uh, at a prescribed price, you know. Okay, that that's, uh, gets into a, a situation where the broker can, you know, be the first one to exit, for example, when the stock price rises, you know, they cap- help cap- capitalize a company, the company goes up, and guess who's the first one to exit stage left? It's the broker. They take a lot of money with them. If retailers aren't aware of that, that's part of how this works. Is brokers, that legal, yeah. though? I'm sorry to interrupt here, but is that? Yeah. Yes, brokerage fees are, are fully legal, and they are basically what motivates brokers to, to help finance these companies. Okay, so, so we yeah. can have a broker who. You know, Bob get, gets gets warrants awarded, shares awarded. And, you know, he calls me up, calls me and like a bunch of other people up. And he says, this company, great company, just buy the shares. It's going to go up. Start, company starts going up at the top. He decides, let me start selling some shares. And he can just freely start selling shares. And it's perfectly legal. He's not going to go to jail. Uh, it's, it's a little bit different. Let me explain this. Okay. So the brokers, uh, they, you know, as a collective, a bro- you know, a finance house, uh, they have brokers, bankers, they have analysts inside their agent organization too. 
All right, so usually when they come and they help a junior company raise money, let's say the junior company, I'll just pull some numbers out of me. Let's say they're, you know, a startup trading in a quarter or something like this. They help them raise a few million bucks on, you know, the notion they're going to go out and, and do some exploration work that's going to increase the value of that, that stock dramatically. Okay, uh, the brokers can come in. They can help to get this finance done. They will take 6% in cash. So let's say the company raises $5 million. They would take 300000 in cash fees, 6%. But they would also get 6% broker warrants of the number of uh, shares that were placed. You know, like at, at 5 million bucks at quarter apiece, you're talking about 20 million shares issued. Well, the broker would get, what is it, about 1.2 million broker warrants, okay? Okay, then over the next four months, because these stocks have a four-month hold usually, unless they're, you know, a prospectus offering, uh, they have a four-month hold. That means they the brokerage house their analysts and others can really talk the story up, get the excitement going behind the junior company, and maybe it's justified. Maybe the junior company is making a discovery, which is, is great. But they now have those 1.2 million broker warrants that they can exercise and, and basically ed, exit stage left uh, before anybody else. Like, so it is, uh, look, oftentimes those broker warrants do not have the same restrictions as the rest of everyone, okay? And that's where you got to watch out because you, you ne next thing you know, you're thinking, my gosh, why is, why is this stock down? I thought they were doing great. You know, it's they're two and a half months into their program and the stock's not doing as well as you thought. You know, it's oftentimes brokers exiting, okay? And then guess what? <laughs> when the four-month hold comes off, you know, you all of a sudden see a fairly, fairly precipitous drop in the share price. Why? Because a lot of those people who have now made money, those participants in that placement, they also decide to take, you know, part or maybe even all of their money off the table, you know. And so you see a weakness in, in the junior stock, even if it's doing well sometimes. Okay, that's what's befuddling to most, uh, most retail investors. So what is something that I could do beforehand? What are, what are some of the questions that I could ask myself or some of the research that I can do to protect myself from that? Look, uh, you know, a lot of, of uh, investors, retail investors especially, don't necessarily want to read the details about placements uh, in the finances of the company and so forth. But I would actually urge you to, to do that due diligence alongside the fun stuff, you know, the geology and the potential, you know, for discovery and so forth. It, it's These exploration companies are not just purely about what discovery they're going to make. They're also about the, the financing, the underpinnings of their, their share st structure, their, you know, the amount of warrants and options that are out. When do those warrants and options expire? Whose hands are those in? You know, there's a lot of things that folks should look at. They should also look at the burn rate of the company. You know, is the company capable of undertaking the expiration plans that they've laid out to the market. You know, are they going to are they going to need money in two months from now? Are they going to need money in six months? You know, find these things out, and then, you know, I, I guess what I would recommend is most retail investors, if you want to get into this space, keep a spreadsheet together. You know, make your own spreadsheet. Keep keep track of of the stock. You know, as well as what warrants they have, when they expire, uh, options when they expire. Um, you know, when the four-month hold comes off, et cetera, et cetera, all these, these details, you know, the broker warrants, et cetera, all this stuff I'm talking about, like, you know, keep a scorecard, so to speak. And that way you're not caught offside. You know, you, you, you're smart. You can say, oh, okay, I can see the share price is down right now because there must be somebody exercising a bunch of warrants, for mm -hmm. example. You know, and I see that, especially this time of season. Uh, you know, there's a company that's done well, in the past couple of months, you know, during the expiration season and the share price is going up and then all of a sudden you're sitting here in September or October and you're like, my gosh, why have these guys lost, you know, 60% of their value? Oftentimes it's because the warrants that were issued in that placement back in the spring that, uh, you know, that came along with, uh, you know, it's a, cheap, a cheaper placement, uh, they're well within the money and folks are like taking, you know, they're exercising those warrants and they're taking a lot of uh, profit off the table. So. Mm. Yeah, it's an uncontrollable 
supply of shares that come in, comes into the market for the company. Like the company cannot control it, the, the broker in this case can control it. So there's a couple of important questions that I wrote down. You gotta start with when, when did it expire? When's the four month period expire? How much, like how, how, how many warrants? But it's how much of the float is in warrants? Like is it 10, 20, 50, yep. 2000%, who knows, right? And then also an important question that I haven't thought about before is who who holds those shares? What, what are those warrants and, yep. and the shares? What are, what are the goals with it? Do they want to hold it for a long period or is it just a broker who's brokering the deal and you know, you know that the image of the broker is just a guy who wants to make a quick buck? Well, then you know after the four-month period, there's going to be a supply of shares coming in and, and, and that's going to be like a drag, you know, an extra weight on the stock price. Am I getting this correctly? Uh, yes, you know, and on that last note, uh, look, you know, people who invest in this space, you know, the bigger players, they develop a reputation after a while. Uh, so a lot of retailers, you know, should do research into who those investors are. There are stories that you might go, wow, you know, I can see that this, uh, this company is being backed by a fund that has a reputation for basically blowing out their shares after a couple of months or after the hold comes off. Okay, get smart, learn about it. Okay, it's your job as an investor to really to, to learn the ropes of this game. Uh, I see a lot of retail investors come into this space and you know, it's it. this is what I was saying at the beginning, we need to clean up, uh, you know, if you wanna talk about that, I'll tell you how I think we have to clean things up. But. Uh, you know, in 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 light of in lieu of that, I should say, uh, you know, the the fact that we need some fundamental uh, restructuring in this space, the best way for retailers to protect themselves and play this game is to get smart. Okay, uh, you have to know the how these things work. You have to become familiar with the the investors in certain stories. If if you don't, that's who your com- competition is with. Okay is is the other investors uh and they you know a lot of these guys are pretty slick they'll they'll they know how to sell before you they know how to short we haven't even talked about that okay did you know that that your brokerage account your broker might actually have the ability to borrow shares out of your account to short uh, a stock okay now think about that for a minute hmm i bet a lot of retail investors didn't know that okay uh if you have a brokerage account uh usually in the in the fine print there somewhere when you sign the darn thing there is a uh, verbiage around the ability of the broker uh, acting on your you know supposedly acting on your behalf uh there's verbiage that they, that allows them to to use your shares basically against you okay uh this was a big deal a few years ago especially uh, say in the period from 2000 12 through 2015, I know a lot of retail investors got burned badly because the gold space was coming off. Uh, all of the junior companies were falling. And guess what? Uh, the brokers were going, hey, you know, we can make a lot of money short in these stocks. And they would literally just use the, the shares uh, that these poor retail investors had against them. Yeah, the, the worst part about it is that it's completely legal and it's completely with your consent. Even if you don't know it, it's with your consent because who reads the small letters, right? Yep. Uh, well, I guess I should start doing that. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great point. It's, uh, that's the reason why people don't want to get into this. It's a nasty business. It's be, it, it, you know, it, and there's a lot of other players that we're going to, you know, market participants that we're going to discuss here. But there, there, there's a lot of things that we could also do. You said, how do we clean things up? How, how, how do we clean things up when it comes down to brokers? Well, look, um, there there are a lot of regulations around brokers. I'm not going to say that it's just an all you know. It's not like the wild west, but we need to to look very hard at how the the overall mechanics of finance work inside the junior company and come up with a better system. Okay, I I truly think that unless we do, and, and until and unless we do. <clears throat> you're not going to see the retail come back to this sector in a big way. Okay. And that's, that's very sad to think. All right. Uh, we need to, I'm not saying I have the perfect solution in hand right this second. I've got ideas, but uh, I would say broker warrants, 
they should not be allowed to to exercise those prior to the four month hold. I think that that is one thing I would uh, take away. Uh, I would also say that the the terms of of the fees that the brokers receive uh, has got to be on the condition that they provide benefit to the company in some way, shape, or form. Okay, um, I you know it's it's great like. My experience with with brokers, oftentimes, is is that they they're happy to take the fees, but oftentimes after they've taken the fees, you don't hear bugger all from them. <laughs> okay, and that's disturbing. All right, um, we need to see more and better analyst coverage. For example, we need to to be more professional about this. These brokers and the the brokerage firms need to actually provide the necessary support for the junior companies that helps truly get the story out. And there's, there's ways to do that in a meaningful way. You know, I you know, watch when retailers watch these brokers come in and basically take their fees and run like mad. It, it leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth. True. And, well, imagine if, if we had certain commitments written in stone that the brokers uh, were not the first wants to leave, you know, exit stage left, but had to exit perhaps even after, uh, you know, the participants in the placement. That would certainly improve things. How about if we had a commitment from brokers on a routine basis to also help provide analytic support, analytic analysis of the junior company? That would help. Uh, You know, with that, you got to make sure it doesn't just appear, you know, hollow. You don't want... uh, analyst coverage that is just, you know, like BS, basically, you want something real. But, you know, if there's truly a buy into this, the exploration story of the junior company, I'd like to see analysts make or the brokers make commitment that their analysts cover those companies, you know, and they have to do it for a prolonged period, say a year or two, at least. That way, they can't just, you know, wash their hands and walk away. Mm. That's true. That's true. It's very well said. What I'm getting from you, though, about what I could do about it is I could start by reading, read about your broker, read what it allowed to do when there's a financing, read about it and see who's owning the shares. Heck, I don't know. Send them an email and ask what their plans are. Why did you buy? How long did you plan on holding the stock? Right. Might as well get an answer. Yep. So read, yep. ask questions. And, you know, if, if you find a broker who's you know, documents are, are proving to you that they might use your shares against you. They, they might burn you in one way or another. Just don't give them your business. Don't just don't, I mean, don't, don't invest with them. Even if they're the cheapest broker out there, you know, that's not everything. There's, you know. Well, here's the thing though, Antonio, is that even a lot of the big brokerage houses have this, this wording in there. Okay. You can, as an investor, you can go to your broker and say, you know what? I don't like line, you know, three point eight point or whatever you know i want that out you know you can negotiate your your brokerage service basically it's it's a little bit trickier for most people but if you're you know if your broker is an honest bloke and or gal you know that they, they should be able to to work with you and work with their compliance department to see if they can get uh, an exemption around using shares for for shorting so mm. Okay, good, 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 good. Well, that's a great first point on brokers. Uh, but you also told me that's not everything, unfortunately. Something else that you, you just talked about, analysts. Now, there's something that's just a degree below analysts, <laughs> oftentimes, so to call it, and that's newsletter writers, YouTubers mm-hmm. like me, if you want. There's ways that they can take advantage of retail investors as well, is what you told me. What, what did you mean by that? Yeah, look, the the letter writers are by and far independent uh, of the companies. I mean, it, there there's strict rules around engagement between the company and a letter writer. Okay, uh, and a, a lot of the letter writers use strategies uh, like you know uh, sponsorship and so forth, which is illegal. You know, the company can sponsor a website, for example. And that's fine. Uh, but if there's anything directly tied to promotion between the company and the newsletter writer, that's pretty strictly forbidden. Why? Well, because of what you just said. A lot of, you know, in the old days, the good old days, a lot of letter writers 
we're kind of pump and dumper types and that, you know, the restrictions that were applied after that uh, were meant to, to basically kill that part of this industry. Unfortunately, uh, what letter writers have, uh, have now found is they can still kind of work in, independently. They can pre buy, look, I'm not saying this, I, I do not know the business of most letter writers. I, I don't really want to spend my time finding out, you know, what letter writers and, and so forth do. But um, I do know there are cases where letter writers will buy a stock. They kind of have a, a target, we'll call it. Uh, and so they buy the stock beforehand. And then they, even though they don't have an agreement with the company, they'll promote it uh, independent of the company. And that share price will rise, and then they can sell uh, after that share price has risen. And you know what? It it is hard to control. It's very hard to control. Right? You um, just told me the story of. Uh, sorry to interrupt here, but you just told me the story of uh, a certain John Doe from a certain country that did that back in the day. Maybe you can tell me how that happened again. I think that's an interesting story here. Uh, yeah. Look. The, in that case, the fellow was an analyst. He, he uh, worked for a brokerage house or, you know, investing house. And he was talking up a company as an analyst, a professional. He was talking up a company, the investors, uh, the customers of that um, investment house. Uh, they bought up the stock in that company. Okay, but on the flip side, uh, he developed an ulterior persona and was talking negatively about it as a, in an anonymous way, you know, a, a pseudonym, and basically was playing both sides of the, the fence there. So um, that's another very dark, uh, you know, we'll call it uh, occurrence in, in that, that letter writing and anal, analyst realm. And I, you know, I, it's disgusting. I don't know how you stop it exactly, but it happens. I wouldn't know how to stop this. There's plenty of regulations, just as you said, around that, but it's not waterproof. Right? A lot of a lot of people slip through. So uh, I guess reputation. I guess it goes back to reputation again, right? Just yep. before you start trusting a newsletter writer, just first of all, don't. Okay, there's no reason. There's no, especially not like someone like me. I'm just starting out and. Like I would say that not many people would be honest about it. Like I'm just starting out. I, I, I don't have the experience. I don't know what I'm doing. Not many people will be honest about, you know, I'm being sponsored in one way or another, but a company just look for honesty, integrity, and just check the, you know, I guess check, check the reputation of the person. Talk to a couple of people that have been subscribed, send out a couple of emails. You'd be surprised how many people would answer your emails. Heck, Dr. Henny, you answered my emails. Didn't expect that to happen. And then, you know, we're what, like a year and a half further. We've been talking almost uh, monthly, actually, almost weekly, really. So it's, um, yeah, sending out emails, check the reputation. That's what I, I would say about newsletter writers, knowing a little bit about the, the internet business myself. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, it doesn't end there. So we got brokers trying to take advantage of you, newsletter writers, but then you also have, um, you know, insiders, practically. CEOs, they could, yeah. you know, they could be in there to buy fancy suits and have a lifestyle company instead of, you know, making you money and putting you, or taking your money and putting it into the ground and making you even more money. Mm -hmm. That's what you told me. So how, how does that go? What do you know about that, Dr. Henny? Look, uh, there are a lot of, uh, I'll call it professional, uh, professionals in this space. I'm not sure what to call them exactly, but uh, who, who are... <laughs> We were looking at this industry as uh, a way to make short-term gain. Um, they'll come off oftentimes very, very sophisticated, very slick. Um, they will come in, uh, set up a company, promote it, but they will find some avenue to exit stage left and leave everybody holding the bag. Okay, this is why this industry has a terrible reputation is that there are, there are a population of people in this space that do this habitually, okay? Um, you know, I could spend probably an hour talking about how I think we should, you know, what rules we should have in place uh, to, to prevent these things from happening, but they do, they happen, okay? Now, one thing I would say is 
you know, usually when somebody does that once or twice, they get a reputation. So again, it's up to the retail investors to really do a little deep dive into the people behind each company to make sure you're not dealing with somebody who's likely going to pull a fast one. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, that's the best way to, you know, protect yourself. Now, you know, that said, um, it does happen. It's, uh, it's troubling. It's what gives our industry a bad reputation. And I think this is probably the, the most fundamental reason we need to give the whole um, system a pretty good scrub here so that we clean up this base and we get retail investors back into this. Imagine if we had retail in, in, uh, investor interest like, you know, tech industry or something like this. I mean, imagine if we saw a large number of retail investors come into this space. Let's do it. Let's let's clean up our act, guys. Uh, <laughs> How would you yeah. do that if you had like a magic stick or whatever? You just wipe it. What do you do? Well, look, you know, people who have, we'll call it pull a fast one, these management types to set up company and, and basically, uh, they they get it highly promoted and pull and then pull out pull out of it. You know, uh, they need to be basically regulated strongly. Like they, these are, uh, to be blunt, they're sociopaths. Okay, <laughs> the way you control a sociopath, you don't you don't uh, pussyfoot around. You you have very very strong regulation around the ability for these kind of players to be in this space. Okay. If you don't put that kind of a barrier around these types of personalities, these types of people, you're going to end up with the situation we have. And, you know, it only takes a few of these, you know, three, four, five of these habitual yeah. sharks to, to give a bad reputation to the rest of us. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Uh, I've been in this since the beginning of 2020, less than two years. And I've, uh, I've already noticed a couple of people that do that over promotion. Definitely as a YouTuber, you'd be surprised how many companies just reach out to me and just want to promote a company that way. Uh, and it's the CEO themselves sending me an email wanting to promote the company, wanting to pay for it illegally, you know, saying stuff like, can we maybe just, you know, just don't mention that you're being paid maybe and then we can pay, you know, we can put something on top and some of these sleazy, like the stuff that I'm asking myself, like, did that ever work? Like, I mean, it's not the sixties anymore or whatever. I don't know. So, um, it's, yeah, that's another, another pitfall okay. there. That, that allows you to discriminate who, who's probably worth working with and who's not. Okay. Okay. And, you know, I guess uh, what I would do is I'd throw it right back at you. you know, part of your responsibility as uh, I'm not sure what you guys call yourselves. I mean, your social media types or whatever, you know, like uh, YouTuber is your job is to help inform retail investors, right? You, you yourself can be the, the voice. Say, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about these guys. Oh, so here's the thing. Do you think that's okay? Because I've thought about doing that. Like I do get emails, and I've thought about exposing those emails, but I just don't know if that's okay. Because I don't, I'm, you know, I don't want to necessarily go ahead and hurt the company. I just don't want to deal with them. But I don't, I don't know if even you if it's free to, to talk about like emails. I, I do not think I would put my money into this company. You're welcome to say things like that. But uh, like I'm not because because I gotta give a reason for it. And if I say you know I'm, I would not put oh, my money know. into it because they no, just offered me twenty thousand dollars to promote and and lie about it. No, you don't. Look, I, you know I'm fifty four years old. You're I don't know how old you are, but twenties I'm assuming. Twenty six, okay. yeah. One of the things you learn is you learn to keep your mouth shut when you don't have to give an excuse. Hell no. <laughs> Why? <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, just say I I will not deal with that company. Well, that sends a message. Hmm. Yeah, it does. Okay, good, good, good. It's good to think about. Uh, but here's something that I cannot control. There's people out there who have more data than me trading the same market. You know, you got traders with second, third, fifth level data or whatever, and they can just wipe me out as a retail investor. I'm not, I'm not even, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to know why I'm not making any money, but it's going to be because of them. What do you know about that? Uh, if I'm hearing your question right, you're saying there are more sophisticated investors in out there that, you know, pot- potentially have an upper hand on retail, and that's true. I mean, that is, I guess that's a natural uh, occurrence. You know, like you know, if you think of Darwin or something, you know, okay, natural selection. 
yes, there's going to be people who are, are we'll call it smarter at, at certain level. Okay, where where it becomes you know not okay is when the company when the individual has inside information. You know, God forbid that happens. Uh, that is not acceptable. But look, retail investors. The reason I say over and over and over again that you know your job is to get smart is because you've got to compete with these these funds and and others who have in-house staffs who who sit and do the deep dive into these companies. You know, there's in, inside of a lot of funds, there's folks that sit there and their sole job is to keep track of the finances of the invest, you know, the companies they're invested in. So they, they keep track of where the junior company is with their spend, with their expiration program, uh, the data that's coming out, and, and they process it very, we'll call it very, um, you know, systematically, you know. Whereas retail investors are often like, oh, I feel good about this stock. You know, Joe said it was great. No, no, no. Retail investors have got to use the same approach. I really urge retail investors, to, again, set up a spreadsheet that allows you to, to look at all these attributes, not just of the, you know, the company and their target and, you know, their, their geology and so forth, but also keep track of their finances, keep track of the warrants. Keep track. It's up to you to be, to be smart. Uh, you know, is, is it taking advantage of, of a fun uh, you know, knows, it has a sharper, uh, you know, uh, research into a company than the retail investor. No, that's kind of natural. Um, if they, if they get inside information again, that's not acceptable, yeah. but, uh, you know, sending that aside, I think it's up to the retailers right now, barring any changes in this space, it's up to retailers to do their job to get smart. Hmm. Okay. I guess that's, that's, that's the whole message here. There's lots of pitfalls, but it's your responsibility to go around them. We don't have a magic stick, unfortunately. You cannot just you know, wave it and, and, and make everything disappear. But you can start getting smart about it. And, and bit by bit, those bad players in the market are going to start falling off. If you start reading the small letters on your broker and you start giving them your business and on and on and on. And if you start, if you stop tolerating the CEOs who are in there to just take the money, buy fancy suits and, and go out the door, it, you know, if you stop tolerating and, and paying newsletter writers who pump stocks, if you stop giving them the attention, it's all up to the retail people. I guess, I guess that's why you wanted to talk to me, right? You know, I'm going to throw one more in there and this is going to sound funny, but I, I've had an experience even or experiences, I should say, where the retail investors, when especially when a stock goes into the a manic phase, you know, we'll call it goes up the left hand side of the Lasagna curve, they don't want to hear bad news. They they select it, they turn off their hearing aid. Like it it's amazing what happens. Um, I remember one uh, story, this is going back probably ten years ago now, of a company that announced um, a resource uh, of a project in, in Canada, and it was just an absolutely jaw-dropping, unbelievable resource. And I, I actually was vocally critical of this resource that was announced. And um, I remember getting, I thought, wow, you know, I thought people would appreciate the insight that, you know, the reasons why this resource was not well well established, you know, like it was not real. <laughs> okay. And what I found was uh, the retail investors, some of them were absolutely livid because painting a picture of reality meant their share price went down dramatically. Yeah. Next thing I knew I had retail investors very upset with me and it's, it's just interesting. So retailers can also kind of believe their own, you know, what biases, that's something. I guess we can make a complete another conversation on biases, right? There's just so many biases. It's confirmation bias. It's whatever. There's a lot of biases. And uh, I put out a tweet not too long ago. I said something like, when you say that you're not bullish in a stock or that you find something wrong with the company, people are going to accuse you of being a, a, a basher because you want to get the price down and buy yourself. When you say you're bullish in a stock, they're going to accuse you of heck being paid by it or, or just you know having a lot of shares and wanting just the stock to go up 
uh, when you when you have it right, they're gonna say that you maybe had some inside information, and when you have it wrong, they're just gonna say you're too stupid for this. Just you know, give up the junior market and go away. So I guess you cannot always keep everybody happy, right? You're gonna have these things, but uh, I I like the general message that we that, that that you put out here today. A lot of this is in our hands, and we gotta think about these market participants that are not retail investors and we got to ask ourselves what is their reason to be there and to be doing all, all of what they're doing mm -hmm. and, and 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 a lot of that so i i like the general message here um but so if you had to maybe sum it up or just give away the the most important thing what would you say is the big pitfall for natural resource investors the biggest pitfall goes back to what i said at the beginning is that without liquidity this market is exceedingly challenging to invest in okay um when when gold ticks up a bit and you know it, it looks like you know oh wow I can make money in this junior mining space you see a lot of folks come in you see a lot of retail types especially come in I'll call them generalists because they're not necessarily passionate about mining you know they just they see an opportunity to make money okay they come in and for a short while there is liquidity you start to see capital come into the space you know companies doing placements and so forth and the retailer you know, investor might feel very good about things. You know, they, they might see gains, you know, exceptional gains compared to a lot of things they can invest in. And then all of a sudden it ends. Hmm. Well, what happens? As soon as you see that the tides start going out, the liquidity in this space dries up. You must be aware of that. When you invest in the junior space, you must be aware that the, the liquidity will dry up when the the tide turns and you know the tide turns it just it does the gold price goes down um, usually that's what drives it is the sentiment around commodities gold in particular goes down you know you're left high and dry okay and then you're sitting there thinking well uh, my stocks going down but I can't get out okay that's a problem okay people need to come into this with their eyes wide open you got to understand that if you invest in this space, yes, you can see great gains, but the flip side is liquidity can become an issue when the tide goes out. We need, as a mining industry, you know, regardless if the tide's coming in or out, we need to clean up our own act, okay? Like, set all those retail investors aside. We need to clean up this business so that it makes it attractive for the retail investors to come in in a bigger way and mm -hmm. that way tide coming in tide going out it doesn't matter so much okay we don't see the the big whipsaws like we often see in this space we see a more consistent and reliable uh, access to capital and investment interests and so forth and I think that that is what uh, where, where we as a mining industry need to land very quickly here or we're just never going to compete, and it would be it would be devastating, you know, to see, uh, you know, this continued diminishing interest in the mining space as a potential means for returning capital, or you know, or uh, excuse me, for returning uh, or making returns for investors. It's a wonderful space to make money. Okay, yeah. the junior space is it, it is truly a treasure hunt if it's done right. And it's truly an opportunity for people to make multiples on their money. Mm. Yeah. All right? And and there's no other industry out there, to my knowledge, where you can literally go find a body of rock in the ground that's going to add huge value to, to investors' pockets. It's it it's just it's the nature of this business. We've we've done a terrible job managing it, stewarding it. We need to clean up our act. Mm. That's a great message that you're sharing here. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, you know, it makes me think. Makes me think. I, I wrote down a, a lot of things, so I'm gonna be thinking a lot about that. And uh, yeah, Dr. Henny, thank you for stopping by today. It's uh, you know we're already going over time over what you promised me, so I'm gonna let you go. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can further this discussion another time. Anytime, Antonio. Awesome. Thank you for your time.